Hello, welcome along to Writer's Routine. This week, we'll take a look inside the working day of Jeffrey Deaver. Best-selling Jeffrey Deaver, globally successful Jeffrey Deaver. Uh, we'll talk about how his writing style and the process has changed over the last 40 books that he's published. Also, we'll find out how, for him, a writing year mostly isn't even writing. It's planning rigorously, thoroughly, then furiously getting it down onto the page. And also, we'll look at how he views his work in the whole spectrum of books that are out there. These books are roller coasters. They're, they're games. They're toys, they're puzzles. I'm a sleight of hand artist. I'm not an artist artist. I'm, I'm not a, a man booker a writer. I don't have that don't have that skill. Uh, and as much as I read literary fiction and enjoy it, but, but I, that's not what I do. I, I create puzzles and games, and I want people to be exhilarated. So stay there. It's all on the way with Jeffrey Deaver in this week's Writer's Routine. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much for listening. Welcome to Writer's Routine. My name is Dan Simpson. This is the show uh, that takes a sneak peek inside the working day, the writing life of a successful author to try and steal, I guess, some of their scheduling secrets for ourselves. And this week, we're trying to learn from one of the best. If you like your crime, if you like your thrillers, you will know the name Jeffrey Deaver. He's an international bestseller, the author of over 40 novels, 14 Lincoln Rhyme stories, five Catherine Dance books, three in the Rune series, three in the John Pelham series. I'm always interested, speaking to a crime author that's written many books across loads of different characters, how they decide which of their characters, which protagonist, which hero they're going to give this idea to, this crime to solve. Uh, We talk a bit about that through the chat. Uh, and he's invented a new one as well. Uh, it, it's called The Never Game. It's based on Coulter Shaw, who is an enigmatic investigator, aren't they all? Uh, we'll talk about how he had that first idea for the story during the chat. Now, as you can imagine, being a globally successful author, Jeffrey spends a lot of his time writing. So we'll learn about the steps that he takes to make sure that he's alone enough on a thousand seater <laughs> Boeing 747 with enough space, enough quiet to be able to get the story down. Now, we'll also try and do two different writing routines today. His current one that he used for the new book, The Never Game, and also his first one, how he fitted his storytelling around the regular day job. We'll also get a top writing tip from a procedural crime author on the show as well. So stick around for that after we get into it with Jeffrey Diva. And we start, as always, with what he sees around him in the place where he sits down to write. Don, actually, we don't have enough time for that because I, um, I'm being a little facetious here, but I write everywhere. I write um, in, I have two homes. I um I have two offices, therefore. I also ride on airplanes, on trains, in the backs of cars, on beaches if I happen to be on holiday. Um, but I, I can certainly give you the um, particulars of a couple of those places. Please do. I, uh, I, I do not like to be distracted when I write. I have a very nice uh, house in North Carolina. I look out over a lawn and uh, a flower garden, rose garden, a swimming pool, trees, forest. It's quite lovely. My desk faces away from that. And I look at a wall that has a cork board on it on which I uh, plan out my books ahead of time. And I'm sure we'll chat a little bit about uh, the um, uh, mechanics of putting a book together. Um, but uh, then I have bookshelves on either side of that. At my other house, this is in, in Florida, I have a... Um, <laughs> a back view of a lake, which is quite nice, uh, alligators occasionally, uh, and then a, a fairly nice lawn leading down to the lake. Um, and I have an office with no windows in it <laughs> where I sit and I write um, because I really do not want the uh, the distractions. And in that, that that's sort of a vacation home, so I don't really have uh, a lot of uh, research materials there. But but it's it's the the idea that. I am, you know, it sounds a bit pretentious, but one with the book. When I'm writing, I want no distractions. Uh, I have uh, music. I have access to music, but I tend not to listen to music. It's all about me and writing the book. So how does that work then distraction-wise when you are writing all over the place? As you said, when you are traveling, when you are writing on trains and on planes, how do you 
make yourself just one and the laptop in front of you how does that work uh I, I, i'll tell you an anecdote I, I got busted one time so i sat down on an airplane opened my computer and there was a a, a talkative fellow next to me I said where are you from what are you doing oh you got your computer out oh you write books how, how interesting and i uh did what i always do that i didn't have a chance to do this before i pulled out my earphones and uh, not just earbuds but significant earphones uh, put them on and uh, gave the illusion, of course, that I was listening to something. And then he glanced down and noticed that I had not plugged the plug into the computer. So he realized that I had put that on as a device to simply ignore what he was saying. I, I, I could have been a bit more polite and said, oh, I'm sorry, I have to work. But I actually do wear earphones uh, whenever I travel. And they're, they're big, thick Sony earphones. So, so I, uh, and I don't listen to anything. I just kind of blocks out everything else. Uh, that's more of a deterrent then. W- uh, dude. When you are writing all over the place, do you need one thing that's constant? One thing that kind of lets you tap into your story so you can keep working and you can carry on anywhere? No. Um, uh, what I find is that I approach this like a, a, a business. And, and uh, you know, I had been in, I'd been a lawyer for a while, been a journalist for a while. I find writing fiction to be very similar to that. Um, and we'll, uh, I would like to go into later the, the actual mechanics of my putting together a book. But I can say now that um, there's, there's really nothing, I, I shouldn't use the word spiritual, but there's, there's nothing uh, other than mechanical writing for me in other words i sit down i know i have to write chapter seven or i know i have to fill in an outline toward the end of the outline and i sit down whether it's on an airplane or wherever and i say okay it's time to do that and i sit down and i i do that i don't really need any um uh any inspiration at that point i I, you know i may not know exactly what i'm going to write that's the uh, if you want to call it the muse or whatever uh that that i'm uh, the imagination kicks in and says oh well the clue is going to be mustard all right uh what am i going to do about mustard then the imagination kicks in and i uh, have the bad guy walk into a um you know a sainsbury or a white rose or whatever and buy the uh buy the mustard that scene didn't occur to me when i had the outline but i know at that point when i was doing the outline but then i know at that point okay it's time to write about mustard so out comes the mustard uh wherever i am now you've you've handily you're you're helping me out as we go uh, you've done this before. Uh, so the show's called Writer's Routine. So I, I think we're going to talk about three separate writing routines, if that's mm-hmm. okay. We'll talk about your one right now, the one when you started 40-odd novels ago, and also your writing routine for the whole year. As mm-hmm. you say, how do you put together that book? So let's start. Well mm-hmm. um, uh, for, for, for your latest novel then, uh, The Never Game, talk me through an average day from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed when you are writing that the um th- those are a, a brilliant uh, triumvirate of of approaches um but i i will have to say that my working day varies depending on um category three where i am in the process because the process my year-long process varies significantly um so what i will will do is tell you pick just pick an average day um to sort of get my my physical routine of where I am and what I'm doing. Uh, because when we talk about point three, then we'll see that um, in, say, March, I do sit down and do one thing. April, um, May, June, October, I do something very different, even though I'm sitting at the same desk or in the same plane and so forth. But my typical day is um, um, wake up early, 7 o'clock, so uh, feed my dogs, because they require feeding, um, feed myself, uh, they get the food first. I'll, I'll let them out to do their their doggy business. And then I uh, sit down, go to the uh, homepage of my computer, which is the New York Times, uh, see what the American government has got itself up to now, which has got to be, of course, uh, some other type of chaos. That's 10 minutes or so. And then I start, uh, start to work. I'm at my desk. Um, it, it could vary from six hours to 18 hours it's not really a question of um again the inspiration at this age i'm 69 years old well soon to be 69 uh it's harder to sit still than it used to be when i was young i like to get a little bit of exercise so i go out for a walk that takes part of the day but i am um, pretty much tethered to my uh computer uh doing research uh writing the book itself 
at, at a certain level of uh, publishing, and I don't mean uh, a hierarchy, I mean uh, by virtue of the fact that I have many books out, uh, 40 novels, about 80 short stories, uh, those books are in various uh, permutations. For instance, um, there is going to be a remake, or it's not a remake, it's an original TV series based on the Bone Collector book. That was the movie, of course. Now it's going to be an NBC TV pilot. Well, one of my, my typical writing day would be interrupted by doing press about that. I'd get calls about interviews, and I might write those down in email, or I might uh, actually talk to a journalist about it. I have um, publishers around the world, about 30 or 40 publishers. They are bringing books out at different times. Um, uh, in other words, a, a book that, of mine that was published uh, five years ago in America and the UK is now being published for the first time in, uh, it, it could be uh, the Czech Republic or Russia or wherever. Have to talk to the agent and the uh, often the translator about that. So little uh, business things uh, intervene. At the end of the day, um, I have a partner. She and I um, have several houses, and so we uh, are often together, but often we're not, and that's uh, that's worked out very well for both of us. Um, I will uh, have a, a bite of dinner and usually get back to the computer. During dinner, I will like to see what is uh, going on in the, the world of culture. That means what's going on in Breaking Bad the latest uh, sequel to that is Better Call Saul. Oh, fascinating. What else is on Netflix? What else is on TV? I, I watch some TV, not very much. I uh, actually found that when I watch a show or a movie or read a book, I get anxious about getting back to my own work. Uh, you don't get into this business without loving books. And I've read how many? A hundred thousand books or so in, during the course of my life. But I, um, I want to get back to doing what I do. So if I'm uh, at home by myself, get back to the computer and work all over again, uh, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, it's uh, quitting time, time for bed. And then uh, things starts all over again the next day. Variation on time is largely because of other things I have to do in my life, because one does need to get his or her car registered, for instance. I travel a great deal. I have as an avocation, Madeline, my partner and I, we uh, breed and show uh, dogs. Uh, we do the, in America, we do the, like the Crufts type of showing you have here. Uh, so I will occasionally go to dog shows and I may have to uh, pick up my dog from the groomer, uh, get the dog ready to go to a, uh, a dog show. So that would be a six hour day. Um, uh, the uh, 12 or 18 hour days are when uh, nothing else is going on in my life. I have a deadline coming up. And I sit down, roll up my sleeves, and get to work. And I'm, I'm an author that um, uh, I think this is very important for uh, any listeners out there, and I suspect there are some who do want to be writers, that you never, ever miss a deadline. That's period. There's just no, no two ways about it. Um, you can negotiate deadlines with your editor, but if you have a set deadline, you meet it. And that might be an 18-hour day. So what's the secret to that then? Is it that you, you know how much you need to get done per day? Have you, I mean, we'll come to this later when we talk about the whole year, but do you figure out how long a Jeffrey Diva book needs to be? I don't know, say 100,000 words, then you figure out how much that is a day. I've spoken to some authors who do do that. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's <clears throat> when I teach my courses in writing, I tell my students, whatever works for you works. It's a very subjective thing. I have a very um, uh, specific routine in crafting a book. It works for me. I've developed that over the years, as one of your, uh, one of your uh, questions alluded to. But the, the reason it's difficult for me to answer that question is that I, I no, I don't go by word count, but um, we'll talk about this more in a minute, I'm sure. But I do a very extensive outline, and that takes a huge portion of the year. All I do is the outline. So I, 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 don't, I don't have a word count with the outline. I, I don't hold myself to a standard. I say, what am I going to get done during the course of this, uh, in the case of doing the outline, eight months, and per day um, – all I know is by the end of that eight months, a hundred, roughly 110 to 150 page outline has to be finished. And I, um, 
I sit down and do that uh, during the eight months. And then I realize, okay, I've got the outline, maybe noodle with it a little bit, and then uh, sit down and write the actual book itself. Do you see why it, 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 it be, with the outline, it kind of skews the writing process that most authors have because I do not write a word of prose for eight months. I do not put together the book for eight months. It's all a schematic, uh, basically an engineering diagram of the book from start to finish. You say that this is like a business for you. Mm -hmm. It's not like a, a regular author who thinks, it's not like an author who may think of themselves as an artist. Mm -hmm. This this is a business. How have you refined, I guess, the shop floor uh, over so many years? What was the first book that you published? The first book I published, um, can I say the book from hell on a podcast? Is, can I use that word? Is that, that's acceptable? I suspect you've heard worse. Um, uh, it was called Voodoo. It was a uh, my one nod to um, horror, a Stephen King kind of kind of novel, and um, I have always loved surprises and twists and turns. And when I began writing, I knew my books were going to have that element. And I, I was very influenced by Agatha Christie, Edgar Allan Poe, for instance. But I I didn't really know how to go about writing a book. I read constantly. And so I sat down and simply started to write a book with a vague idea of where I was going. And I wrote um, that book, Voodoo. I wrote a um, caper book, Always a Thief, after that. They didn't do well. They were what we call, your, I'm sure you're familiar with, paperback originals. Never went to hardcover. This, this was 35 years ago, long before the ebook phenomenon. And they did not uh, do particularly well. And at that time, I think I was an attorney. I'm sure I was an attorney and representing clients who had businesses. I did business law. And um, I, I, I was thinking, I'm doing something wrong here. The product is not meeting the needs of the marketplace because a book is a product. You know, it's no different from toothpaste or mouthwash or an automobile. It's a creative product and one I'm proud of and one I can make as opposed to toothpaste and, and cars. But it's a product. It has to appeal to a, a market. What was I doing wrong? Well, I kept... Uh, kept writing and I, I i'd say is for the next three or so books three or four books i um would spend more time thinking ahead of time i, I did very brief outlines i kind of had an idea then i'd finish the book and I'd, I'd read it and i would outline what i'd written and realize that i'm making a lot of mistakes i give away um a plot point early in other words, I allow the reader to anticipate what's going to happen. And it's not a twist. That was just an error. I would digress. Um, the books were set in, most of them set in Manhattan, I think. And I, I love the city. It's as you know vibrant as, and, and as exciting as London or, or Paris. And so I would, I would tend to uh, write um, uh, travel elements, you know, a travel essay in the book. It, had no, it was digressive. It had no point there. And around that time, maybe six books in, uh, and the books would, were not... At that point, not doing badly. One, one or two were nominated for the Edgar Award, and uh, some were optioned for films. Uh, nothing ever, nothing ever came of that. But I said, "Oh, maybe there's something to." When I outlined after I'd finished it, why not outline first? And that's what started me on the outlining process. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Over probably the next three, three to four books, I began maybe a ten-page outline and um, would come up with a twist or turn at the end and, and work backwards to seed the clues in to make sure that um, I played fair with the twists and um, those books did a bit better and then I thought well I'm going to go all out the outline is a way to, uh, it, to to craft the plot and plot is what these books are all about my books at least I mean there are superb character-driven novels that they can be literary they can be very uh engrossing psychological thrillers but what do i like to read what do i think my market likes to read fast twist turn limited time frame takes place over two or three days um a surprise ending followed by another surprise ending followed by a third surprise ending um multiple plots uh, subplots as well as the main plot, each of which has a surprise ending on it. How do I do that? Have to outline it. And that's when I began 
my process, which I have followed over the last, say, 35 novels, of spending, I do a book a year, eight months doing the outline. That's all I do. And research, too, I should say. I, not Because my books are full of facts and details that I think readers are going to enjoy. But uh, so that... Um, Eight month period. I mean, you know, very seven to seven to eight months, uh, doing nothing but the outline, and when that's finished, the outline will have every single plot point, every character, every clue. As I was mentioning before, uh, I know when every character enters the book, um, and when they leave, either vertically or horizontally, because not everybody survives the end of a Jeffrey Deaver book. And when that's done, I, I put that in front of me um, in one notebook. I have my research in usually two notebooks next to me. In the outline, I will make an annotation as to what research should be put into that scene. I'll give you an example. Um, my, my most famous character, Lincoln Rhyme, is a forensic scientist. And uh, let's say he needs to find um, a clue about a, um, a, 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 a shell, uh, like an oyster shell or something like that. Well, I have researched the the chemistry and the geographic location of oyster shells in Manhattan, and I, I, I read through my outline. Here's uh, scene forty two. Lincoln Rhyme finds clue in a shell. That's all it says. That's all the outline says. Then there's a little annotation next to that. R, uh, I don't know, one hundred and fifty. I'm making up the numbers. R one hundred and fifty. Research page one hundred and fifty. I flipped one hundred and fifty. There's a, um, you know, it could be Wikipedia, it could be the, the Oyster Council's uh, fact sheet on oysters. And I, I learned this about oysters. I say, okay, that's, you know, oh, that'll be a good clue that oysters uh, making pearls. I don't know. The, the, some oysters make pearls, others don't. That'll be a clue. I close my eyes. I literally close my eyes. Imagine Lincoln Rhyme in the. Um, uh, in, in his um, wheelchair and uh, investigating the crime. And then I write write that scene. And that becomes the chapter um, or the scene because it's not necessarily a chapter. That becomes the, the scene um, about oysters. So uh, the prior, or the early work is the, the eight months is, is, is doing that research and finding out where I think in the plot that oyster clue should fall. I adjust it a lot, move it around. Okay, there it goes. Outline's done. Now we move to the last four months, and bang, out comes that chapter and all the rest of them. And I write the hundred, you know, one hundred and ten thousand words. I do that in two months because I, I know where the, I know where the story is going. I'm never blocked because I know where the story is going. Quickly, before we get back into it with Jeffrey, uh, I want to take a second to welcome anyone that's new to the show. If you have found us recently through one of our mentions in a magazine or something like that, uh, thank you very much for giving us a chance. If you've come back again, lovely that you've stuck around. You've joined us at the right time. You've got over 60 episodes to catch up on, 60 chats with some of the best authors around to, to try and get some tips and some help from them. Uh, uh, by the way, if you do hear a tip that you like, if you catch a little bit of advice that helps the way that you write, I'd love to hear about it. Let me know what episode it was, who said what, how it's helped you. Just tell me about it. You can tweet me um, at Writer's Pod um, so I can follow the journey, if you will, of your listening. Because I'll be honest, there's not a lot of money in this podcasting lark. I mean, I'm not rubbing it in because uh, if you're a writer, unless you're JK Rowling... There's not a lot of money in that either, so I guess you know exactly what I'm talking about. Knowing that you're getting some advice from the authors that we do have on the show, that is really what's important to me. That makes it all worthwhile. So if you hear something that you like, make sure you tell me about it. Tweet at Writer's Pod. I might have said Writer's Routine earlier. Can't remember. On Twitter, we are at Writer's Pod. We're Writer's Routine on Instagram. You can give us a follow on there. Um, or if you do listen to the show as well through Apple Podcasts, um, be amazing. Take a few seconds out of your day and just leave us a quick review. And make sure you subscribe as well. However you listen to the show, if that's Apple, if that's Spotify, if that's Google, however you find us, make sure you subscribe. That really helps out what we're doing. Hello, I'm Lucy Whitehouse. My new novel, Critical Incidents, is out now. Uh, my writing tip, um, particularly particularly useful for starting a first novel, is don't don't be tempted to despair and throw your work in the bin um, if it's not what you if it's it's not what you had in mind when when you began it. I think uh, one of the one of the most exciting 
things is realizing that uh, you know your work has a life of its own but sometimes it goes in in ways that you wish it didn't but I think the best tip I have for getting started with a novel is write until you have so much that would hurt you physically to throw it away because you learn by you learn by writing Um, and even if the 30,000 words that you or 40,000 that you've written and don't end up going in your novel you'll be a better writer at the end of having written them than you were when you started and that's progress you can hear loads more from lucy whitehouse get tips get advice get tricks from her uh, find out how she made the move to procedural crime instead of psychological thriller uh, she was last week's guest so you can catch up on that at writersroutine.com and while you're there if you've got a tip if you've got some advice yourself something that really helps your work through the day uh, send it to me on the website and i'll let everyone else know what it is i'll share it to our writing community here on the show you can tell me your tip over at writersroutine.com let's get back into it then with jeffrey diva uh, we pick things up talking about research because to tell you the truth i've spoken to quite a lot of crime and thriller writers on the show and and many of them don't really focus on the research too much i think it's split down the middle some will pour over texts and books and crime notes for ages and they'll go on you know exhausting ride alongs with the local police just to make sure that everything they're writing is accurate it is true and it is believable but i remember speaking to one crime author can't exactly remember who it was who didn't really do a lot of research at all. They thought it was kind of unnecessary that readers loved their stories because of the hook, because of the plot and the narrative and all the extra filler, all the fluffy research and the extraneous details that they found, often they were unnecessary. And I put this to Jeffrey. I told him about this writer who doesn't really do a lot of research and he he disagreed really. And he said that for his readers, it's not just about the story. They're very keen to learn things as well. My job is to serve my readers and give them a good experience, a fun experience. These books are roller coasters. They're, they're games. They're toys. They're puzzles. I'm a sleight of hand artist. I'm not an artist artist. I'm, I'm not a, a man booker writer. I don't have that don't have that skill. Uh, and as much as I read literary fiction and enjoy it, uh, b- but I, that's not what I do. I, I create uh, puzzles and games, and I want people to be exhilarated. Part of the exhilaration I have found um, among my readers from doing like informal focus groups is that they love to learn things. And I know from my own reading, I love to learn things, uh, uh, facts about maybe it's oysters, maybe it's architecture, maybe it's uh, uh, the um, uh, the chemistry of uh, cleaning water. Uh, but what the other author might have been referring to is excessive research, what it becomes a bit of a fetish. And my rule in uh, research, uh, two, two rules. One, you have to be accurate. You have to get it right. Because nobody puts a gun to your head and says you have to put in the fact about this Pentium processor and when it was built. Uh, but if you do, you have to get it right. And fact check it multiple times. Number two, you can't digress. The point of research is to enhance the reader's um, emotional experience. And because people are naturally curious and we read to learn in addition to being thrilled, uh, they just enjoy learning stuff. But you cannot slow the story down um, by adding too much. If you find a subject fascinating, do what an author like Tom Clancy did and Take that out of the the book itself and write a separate, maybe article, blog, book about missiles in the military or something. Don't have five pages of how to build a missile. Uh, all you need to know is that all the reader needs to know is that this is a credible portrayal of something. And I've learned a, a, a new factor and I like that. You say that you write a book a year. Let me take you back then. Well, what must have been 18 months, two years now. Um, talk to me about the very first moment that the idea for the new story, The Never Game, came into your head? Um, the Never Game is, uh, and I'll just mention the, the idea very briefly, um, my uh, hero, it's a new, a new character I've created, uh, and he is a, um, 
a fellow who um, is a bit itinerant. He um, was the son of a survivalist. And I'm, I'm sure in the UK that you have the survivalist concept as well. These are people who kind of live off the grid. They often are a bit paranoid about the government, their neighbors, and, uh, you know, corporate America, the uh, uh, the hidden state, for instance. And some are nutters and some are, you know, they just enjoy living outside and being uh, self-reliant. And um, uh, Coulter Shaw, uh, Coulter named after a mountain man. These were kind of uh, characters from 19th century America who, who lived by themselves. Father was a, his father was kind of obsessed with this lifestyle, named him that. And he, um, uh, he what he does is he travels around the country and um, looks for rewards that are offered by either the police or private individuals. And I think the, I, and, oh, and I should say the reason uh, I, I created this, a character like this, is that um, it gives me the opportunity to take him any number of places and write about the, you know, I could put it slightly artistically, the heart and soul of maybe San Francisco, or in this book, Silicon Valley. Uh, about which I learned a great deal, and I hope my readers uh, will learn quite a bit too. And um, or he may go to Cleveland, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, a, a small industrial town in America, which has its own heart and soul. So, so that will allow me to write some uh, regional, uh, regional mysteries because. Uh, Lincoln Rhyme is largely uh, set in New York City. I will continue to write the Lincoln books, but uh, I'm, I, I myself am digressing a bit now and not not too responsive to your uh, to your question. But where did the idea actually come from? Uh, I'm I'm kind of like a sponge. I I have uh, here being in London here. I've come up with probably three or four ideas for novels. Now I'm 69 years old. My idea file embraces probably 50. Ideas that, that could be, you know, credible ideas for novels. I'd probably discard some of them. Not going to be able to write all of them. But the, the one idea that I, I think was kind of inspired by, um, it could very well be, a, 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 I think it was a story in America about a, a girl who had gone missing. And the parents offered um, an escalating uh, reward. Uh, I, I think it, it probably the story, I don't recall the details, probably did not have a happy ending. She, uh, I don't think she was ever recovered, but the um, reward was, uh, was quite high, several hundred thousand dollars. And I thought, what about a character who doesn't really need money, but he is, he's kind of, he's driven. He is somebody who is a very restless person. And he sees a reward, and a re- reward represents... Um, a, a, a very difficult to solve condition or situation or perhaps an insoluble situation. And that that would provide him the opportunity to kind of put this restlessness at bay. And he, he, he calls a reward like a red flag and that something that draws him uh, so that he's never bored, that he's never uh, in stasis. And uh, was it going to work? I had no idea. But I began outlining it, and uh, this is where I often get questions from my students. What about writer's block? What do you do about that? My response is that there's no such thing as writer's block. There's idea block. And if you know what you want to write, you can write it. You know, Anyone who can speak and has relative command of the language uh, is going to be able to put together a story based on that idea. It may not be a bestseller, but nonetheless, you, you can do that. You will not be blocked. The, the blocking comes in from when you get to a point where you don't know what you want to, what you want to write. And um, with the outline, I, uh, for instance, never sit down, as you gathered from my earlier comments, sit down at page one and write you know what I might have come up with is an opening scene that's just a bang up set piece. It's just just energy going uh, nonstop. Like the, I don't know if you've seen the movie Deadpool, uh, which I absolutely love. Uh, and the opening scene of that is cars flying and bullets flying and people leaping through the air. It's 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 quite a uh, quite an exciting scene. And the the author will write the first chapter and bang the energy's up. Second chapter bang, third chapter less bang, fourth chapter less bang, fifth chapter sixth chapter. You've got 180 pages of prose, and you don't know where it's going. The middle is, all you can foresee is filled with cliches. It's a deus ex machina ending where the bad guy comes out of left field. We didn't see him or her coming. And you can't write that book. That's a disservice to readers. We owe everything to our readers. But if you do the outline, and you don't, 
you, you, you resist the impulse to write that wonderful set piece. You put it on a little post-it note. You can actually write wonderful set piece beginning. Slap it in the upper left-hand corner of your corkboard. And then you look at where chapter two is. You write chapter two. And then you, you suddenly realize after five days or a week, there's no place to go with that. You put it aside. You just throw that the whole thing aside. And you have not wasted that time. You go on to something else. Well, with the, the Colter Shaw um, story... I uh, decided to set it for one reason or another in the video gaming world. Uh, that I can't tell you where that idea came from. But there's a reward for a girl missing in Silicon Valley. And it, um, um, it, this scenario, as I was starting to do the outline, uh, suddenly there came to me a number of good twists and surprises. Uh, you know the, the uh, reversals toward the end that we I, I I hope readers don't see coming. I always like it when a reader. I have three surprise endings. I always like it when a reader gets one or maybe two, because they're th- that means they're into it. They're they're kind of into the book and they're playing the game with me. But then I often get that third one in. They never saw they never saw that coming, and so those were little post it notes that went toward the end. And then I just kind of in the book filled itself in. I didn't know whether it was going to work. I w- I was all ready to go on and do something else, but this, it all came together. My emotional satisfaction is the joy of writing, which I, I do, and, and just the puzzle of, and the challenge of putting words together and tell a story that I think works. That's one, the, the, then the emotional payoff when I uh, sell a, a, you know, a fair number of books. I'm not talking the, the finance, I'm talking about that means people respond. But with regard to uh, the criticism of, uh, of uh, a formula, which is a very valid, very, very valid one. But my response is this. I uh, fly a great deal. Fly, last year, flew 180,000 miles. I got onto, what would that be? Maybe 50 airplanes, all of which had been built according to formula. And we know they work. I know what I'm getting. I uh, do not want to get on a biplane. I don't want to go to the airport and, uh, you know, I, I go to British Air or uh, United and they say, well, we don't really have an airplane. We have a sphere here. And we've been reading about flying saucers. So uh, do you want to try it? And there probably are people who would want to try the sphere. But I, I uh, no, I want to, um, um, I embrace a formula. And I uh, actually uh, refer to my outline sometimes as an engineering schematic. And uh, but but you have to understand there are um, uh, there are ways to be creative. I, I hate cliche. I tell my students avoid cliches like the plague. Um, <laughs> but I uh, but I will say sometimes you you can step outside the box a bit and yet stay within the formula. And I'll, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I wrote a book called The October List. It goes backwards. It opens page one is chapter thirty six, and you read. The, read through it as one would normally read. The next chapter is 35, takes place about three hours earlier. Uh, next one, obviously, going down to chapter one, the very last page. And I wrote that because I wanted to write a book with surprise beginnings. So what happens is, um, and it's a, it's a short book. I knew this is going to be tough for readers. They, they had to play with me on this one. But I, um, uh, I, I, I wrote the book so that when readers got to chapter three, they realized, oh my gosh, the character that I've been following is not who I thought they were because now their true identity is revealed. Chapter two turns chapter three on its head because there was yet another twist. And chapter one, we realize everything we've been reading is entirely the opposite of what we thought, but it, it, it's fair. It plays into the facts that I've, I've uh, put into the book. Now, that's, that was done by formula, but it's, it's a, a different sort of thing. Let me quickly ask you this before I'm going to be kicked out. Um, and I wish I had more time to speak to you about that one, by the way. That's really frustrating. But I've always wanted to ask an author this, and I've got quite an esteemed one in front of me. Mm-hmm. And if you're a sports person, you, you'll have a trainer. You know, you could be the best sports person in the world. Usain Bolt, he'll still have a running coach. Andy mm-hmm. Murray will still have a tennis coach. Mm-hmm. You're clearly an extremely self-analytical author. We heard earlier how your first few books didn't go as well as you that you would like. So you sat down, you figure out how can I make these better? Who do you turn to now as a, as a 69 year old, mm-hmm. having penned so many books to figure out how you can still get better, how you can still improve. Who coaches you? When I, um, when I, I teach my courses, I say I have many, many rules. And one is that, um, a very important one, is that you need to identify your uh, limitations and your problems. Um, 
uh, your shortcomings, and you have to address them. And uh, an example um, um, is apropos of what, you, what you're asking. I uh, can plot very well. That n- is not a problem for me at all. The um, uh, the, the stories uh, may not fall into everybody's liking, but I can put together a fast-moving plot and can create uh, living, breathing characters, the good guys and the bad guys. I know how to, how to do that. My, my shortcoming and where I do need help is that I, um, I write very quickly. Once I get the idea in my head, I cannot stop myself from, from going forward. I mean, once the outline's done, I'm talking about writing the prose, that 100,000 words in two months, six weeks or two months. Um, it, my prose is very pedestrian. I love writers like uh, Annie Prue, who wrote Brokeback Mountain, the novella that became Brokeback Mountain, The Shipping News, uh, Don DeLillo, Cormac McCarthy, Jonathan Franzen, again, literary sort of, sort of writers, uh, Martin Amos in this country, um, and, um, you know, even even Law, just great, or, or uh, uh, in, in the crime genre, uh, writers like Thomas Harris, Silence of the Lambs, kind of grand guignol violence, but my God, that man can put together prose. That... I have to turn to people to help me with. And I have um, uh, Madeline, my, my partner, reads my books, and she helps me with, with that. Uh, I have uh, editors of my own that I hire. And these are not copy editors to proofread. These are line editors who say, no, this is confusing. What, wait, what, is, what do you mean by this paragraph? They, they can't anticipate the, the, what's going to happen in five, five chapters. So um, I can't say there's a particular mentor, but um, I do address that problem, and I think it's very, very vital. Um, for I, I get this question a lot about um, reading groups, and maybe some of your listeners are, are in those. I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with getting together with other people who write and who enjoy books, and you can often learn learn things from them. But I would just be sure to ask yourself because you are the you are the master of your 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 book or short story. Uh, if the individuals who are giving you in, input are really about um, about helping you, uh, not that they have ulterior motives. I just mean, are there suggestions uh, in harmony with where you know you want to go? Uh, in other words, are they uh, people who really can direct you in in the right uh, right way, or are they maybe a step removed or a step below where your your skill is? So I'm a bit wary of uh, writers groups about uh, uh, writing um, uh, classes. In fact, when I I preface my class by telling my students, um, you may hear what I'm going to tell you. It's, a, it's a basically a four-hour lecture. No workshop. I just talk for four hours. Uh, as you can gather, I don't hesitate to talk a lot. I'm sorry. You probably have a lot more questions now, but still. I, um, uh, but what, I, uh, have, uh, what I've learned is that um, it is very subjective. So what you have to do is ask yourself when you hear my, my course, does this mean anything to me? And I tell my students, you may know all of what I'm going to tell you. You may uh, reject everything I tell you. But at least you're going to see uh, Jeff Deaver talking about Jeff Deaver's books. It's like advice I'm giving to myself. So, um, you, um, uh, you know, as a writer out there, you need to uh, listen to what works for you, accept it, reject it, and just keep going. And that is it for this week's Writer's Routine. Thank you so much to Jeffrey Deaver for coming on the show and a massive shout out as well to Liz uh, as Publishers for finding time in his incredibly busy diary. Uh, you can find out more about Jeffrey's brand new book, The Never Game, over on our website. It's writersroutine.com. While you're there, let me know your writing tip. Tell me about your writing routine. If you've got a little trick that helps you get through the day, you want to share it with us all on the show, do send it over to me. Uh, click on the contact page at writersroutine.com. Remember as well, give us a follow on Twitter at Writers Pod. We're on Instagram as well, Writers Routine there. And next week we should be back uh, with Trent Dalton, an author you might not have heard of right now, but I guarantee you will hear of him soon, making huge waves at the moment in literature. He won Book of the Year at the Australian Indie Awards for his debut novel, Boy Swallows Universe. It's a beautifully twisting and flowing tale. He comes from a journalistic background as well. Uh, so it's quite tight, quite concise, quite 
to the point, as all novels from journalists tend to be, and it's a really nice balance, and the chat is brilliant. I'm not just saying that because it's my show. I've not edited it yet, so I'm not sure how it will come out. But when I did it, I remember he was an absolute joy to talk to. Properly warm, effusive, infectious, with an incredible Australian accent to boot. So make sure you're here next week. You subscribe to the show to make sure that you don't miss Trent Dalton next week on Writer's Routine. I'll see you then. Bye. (laughs) 